Hi, I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk. I am really excited to share with you our new content series called Big Topics, where we're focusing on the most influential things uh, impacting the data center space today. And the first one uh, that we are covering is site selection. And we brought in an expert to cover this topic, Brant Burnett, who is Senior Vice President with CBRE's Data Center Solutions Group. Uh, we talk all about site selection, uh, how it's changed over the many years, and some of the challenges that are taking place today as IT infrastructure demand has, has changed over the last many years. And please listen to the end because I highlight some of Brent's greatest qualities. He's a great musician, he's a great cook, and he needs to start a blog. He's a great writer. I've been trying to get him to do this for years, and so I hope you will encourage him to do the same. Uh, again, this is our Big Topics content series. We cover site selection. I uh, hope you enjoy it. To find the right space for, for McDonald's is really important. To find the right space for uh, an industrial facility that needs ingress, egress is really important. Or an office building to be situated on the right highway. Nothing, and I'm biased, I understand, nothing compares to the site selection process for data centers. You're listening to the Data Center Hawk Podcast, where we demystify the data center market Data Center Hawk is your online platform for data and commentary on the data center market. Stay tuned and be sure to join the thousands of others who rely on Data Center Hawk to make decisions in the data center space. Well, thank you for joining us. I am joined in Dallas with a legend in the data center real estate space, uh, CBRE's Data Center Solutions Group Senior Vice President Brent Burnett is here. Brent, thank you for joining us. Thanks, David. I am excited, not only from a data center perspective, but also from a personal perspective. We had a great uh, run together. I got to work with Brant when we were when I worked at CBRE, and so I learned a lot from him. And uh, just as much as I love his expertise on the data center space, I even love him more as a person. And I know a lot of people out there in our space do too. So thank you. Uh, for you bet. Thanks for being here. Um, we are talking. So this is really fun because we are starting a new um, uh, content series at Data Center Hawk about big topics in the data center space. And so we are starting with site selection. So we brought in good a, place to start. That's right. So we have brought in uh, an expert in that. Um, and Brent, you've been in the data center industry for a long time, uh, came through it from the real estate side of things or got into the business from the real estate side of things. But before we start, give everybody just a, an update on how you ended up here and your career within the data center industry. Sure, um, and thanks for having me. You this bet. is fun. Uh, good to be with you, David. Um, so in 1986, yes, seems like a long time ago, <laughs> uh, I was at SMU and I got in the real estate business, graduated in 87, and uh, by 1992, I was working with a company called the Amon Group, John mm -hmm. Amon, who you know, and I, fell into a transaction that was in downtown Dallas. It was about a 10,000 square foot deal with a telco company called ATC okay. that ended up becoming WorldCom and Verizon uh, after lots of mergers. And um, it was a fairly complicated deal. Um, and it was interesting because of that. Yeah. And uh, lots of moving parts. And there wasn't a lot of competition uh, for that specialty. And so mm -hmm. it kind of stuck. And I did a bunch more deals with them uh, and and others that were in that industry. Um, fast forward to uh, 1998, and I went to work for Trammell Crow Company, sure. which was a great experience. We continued to do a bunch of, of telco work and uh, started to dabble in data center. The yeah. telco and data center business are very synonymous. Sure. There's a lot of bits and pieces that... Um, that fall into each category. Yeah. And, uh, and in uh, 2006, mm -hmm. I left uh, with a good friend of mine, Martin Peck, to uh -huh. start um, Rack House. And it was a great experience. And we were doing tenant rep, basically tenant rep work and some building sales all uh -huh. in the data center industry. And um, it was a it was a, a, a booming time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there was lots of competition that started in Dallas. Again, fast forward um, to 2010, we sold our company or merged mm. with Lincoln. And that entity became Lincoln Rackhouse. And 
It was a great place, but I got a call from another good friend of mine, Blair Oden, who asked um, if I would come help out with the data center uh, business at CBRE. Yep. And in 2011, I came back to uh, Trammell Crow, which was now CBRE, yep. got to be back with a bunch of friends and meet new guys like you, yep. uh, which is when you and I got together. And uh, I've been there now, which is crazy, yeah. for 11 years. Mm. And we've done a lot of really interesting um, site selection pieces all over the world. Mm -hmm. And um, and here we are. It's great. And I, th I think one thing that I would say about it is we've been through a lot. Yeah. That first deal in 92 was 30 years ago, <laughs> which makes me feel really <laughs> old. Um, but we've got 30 plus years left in this tank yeah. um, in the data center industry and it's morphing and changing, but it's really an exciting time to be in the business. Yeah. I always think about when I got into the space, it was like 07. And so if you're, if people listening to this, it's kind of when wholesale co-location sort of started taking yeah. shape. And I, I've always said, I really felt like I was on like a like front row seat to a different part of the industry and how young it was. And I think about like the telco deals that, that you were doing, your team was working on and just the iterations of, of, of challenges this industry has had to uh, figure out how to solve from a real estate perspective. And, and so all that to say, I think you're like, it's really fun for me to talk to people who, you know, now I'm like, well, gosh, I've been in this for like 15 years. And it's fun for me to interact and get to share stories and hear stories from people that have been doing it for you know longer. Well, and it's interesting um, because you mentioned 2007. In 2008, Rackhouse was jamming and doing a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And um, we represented at the time Cyrus One. Uh -huh. And um, we brought Cyrus One from Houston to Dallas sure. in 2008. Yeah. In 2008, <laughs> um, which was, uh, uh, what is that, 13 years ago, yeah. was really the first competitor to the other big yeah. uh, re, uh, digital yeah. in Dallas. And so to think of Dallas as being really only a 13-year-old oh, market, I know. which is so uh, young yeah. in, in relation to real estate just yeah. generally, is just is really cool. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So uh, part of where your focus has been over you know, the last many years has been on this site selection piece. And when yep. we were talking before, you know, when back when I mentioned that 2007 time period when wholesale co-location really started, you know, the the end users themselves or, you know, typically would utilize co-location instead of building and owning and operating their own data centers. That's a trend we've seen kind of take place. Um, and so I wouldn't say there was less value put on, on site selection, we're just doing it less. Um, over the last, I would say, five years, the market has changed significantly. There's been issues with supply chain. There's been a lot bigger demand from different users, and, and the enterprise sector is very active. And so, in my opinion, one of the reasons I want to start with this big topic of site selection is it's become much more important. Uh, there's you, A lot of people believe that there's just land and you can build data centers wherever, you know, and if you have enough money and enough time, maybe you can, but that is not what we have seen. You know, it's really that in each of these markets, there's fewer land sites, fewer places to build. And there's a number of considerations that go on when companies are thinking about this stuff. And so that's what I want to pick your brain about. You're doing this every day. You're talking to people. So from your perspective, give it, maybe just give a background on how it's changed, you know, from those days when you were working with companies, maybe early 2000s to today, what are some of the techniques that have changed or just from your standpoint, how has that process adjusted over the last 20 years? Yeah, so great, lot to unpack there. Yeah. I would say, um, the uh, so the data center site selection industry in particular, That's so it's, there's lots of nuances to sure. that, right? It's go find me a piece of land somewhere. Yep. Um, or it's um, help me find co-location space, yep. or it's some sort of hybrid uh, of of the two, um, and and frankly, some of that is is uh, we've got a building that we need to sell, so there's a lot of potential yep. clients in 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 that space. But the way when I step back and look at at the way the data center industry works yep. and why it's so important, if you look at just the big picture of site selection generally in the real estate business for as long as there's been a real estate business. Um, to find the right space for for McDonald's yep. is really important. 
to find the right space for uh, an industrial facility that needs ingress egress is really important mm -hmm. or an office building to be situated on the right highway nothing and i'm biased i understand nothing compares to the site selection process for data centers mm -hmm. it's really expensive first of all high level if you go build a data center core and shell it's 250 dollars a square foot to turn that core and shell with the power into something that is a data center can be another $1,000 a square foot. Then you've got this beautiful data center, but you've got to rack and stack it. You've got to bring sure. the CPUs in, and that can be another $2,000 a mm -hmm. square foot. And then we've heard of companies, once all that's done, to bring in the software can be another $5,000 a square foot. So you get this hmm. huge cost outlay that you can't make you can't make a mistake. Yeah. And so compare that to if you th think about the for those that are listening, the traditional office, industrial, retail, you know, that is much higher than those asset classes would be investing into a by location. 10 times. There you go. Yeah. And and by 10 times. And so you you um, so it's an expensive mistake to make if you do. make. That's exactly yeah. right. So you, you've got to. That, that's right. I mean, you know, we say all the time, if you do it right, you did your job. Yeah. If you do it wrong, you, you probably have lost your job, <laughs> sure. and and you are um, you know, persona non grata in the sure. in the in the field. Yeah, and um, and so um, so the, so data centers, and I think your question uh, to to take that further is is where has it gone? Where has mm -hmm. it come? One of the things that I think is really interesting. <laughs> And you and I have talked about this before, and I love the topic. I love the topic, especially with young guys, oh, yeah. which used to be you. But yeah, it's no, still, it's not. <laughs> I got a little gray hair going on here. Let's change a bit. Um, but young guys in the industry that, that are interested in how we used to do what we did, yeah. and, and not even in 2000, but even before that. And one of the interesting pieces of it is the toolbox that we carry around uh -huh. with us. And again, you and I have talked about this. Yeah. You get a, um, back back then we would take a map everywhere yes. we went. We'd get on an airplane, first of all. We'd take a map everywhere we went. And the I got really good at folding maps. You know, it's a, <laughs> there's an art to folding a map. And then we had maps go, and then we had flashlights, and then we had tape measures, and we had cell phones, but they were big bulky cell phones oh, yeah. that didn't always work. And we had computers, and we had all that literally in its own bag. Mm -hmm. And every bit of that we can do. Sure. On 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 this. Yep. From from the uh, from the flashlight to the measuring devices yep. to the cell phone to the GPS, everything that we needed um, back then that was so bulky and cumbersome has become um, fairly streamlined. Sure. Kind of yeah. like kind of like the the rest of the of the business. Yeah. You guys have a. There was a story that you know maybe it's you telling me or maybe it was we worked with another team member at CBRA at the time, Chris Herman, about kind of tracking fiber uh, by one like pothole to, or one kind of uh, fiber location to the next. There were three things that we looked for. <laughs> okay, there we go. One was the orange flag. Okay. There was a little bitty orange flag yep. that had the name of the company on it. Okay. And it might have said AT&T or whoever the, yep. the company was that was running their fiber. Yep. And you would follow that, and then you'd see the orange spray paint. Yeah, sure. And that orange spray paint that ruins so many sidewalks in downtown, <laughs> including really expensive sure. sidewalks oh, yeah. in yeah. downtown. Funny. That was the second. And then the third piece was the was the pole, the, the, yeah. the white pole that had the little orange piece on it. And like Chris said, uh, we had, I mean, it was shoe leather. I yeah. mean, you would get out and you would go from, um, you know, one hole to the next yeah. and you'd map that on the map and yeah. then you go to the next That's and then crazy. you'd find out where the handhole was and you'd go find out you know whose fiber that was sure. and a lot of times there was the, the big uh, uh, concrete um, manhole that had yeah. a stamp on it that would tell you who it was oh, oh, yeah. good, like now I know whose fiber yeah. is, is here and we'd do that it was so uh, laborious yeah, I mean sure. it was just tons yeah. of labor that went into it in shoe leather and now you know, there's a company, NEF, or Fiber yep. Locator in Boston, and CBRE bought uh, bought that company yep. um, a couple of years ago. Mike Murphy and his team there have built a product that is just, it's unbelievable, and it, ch it takes so much less time, I mean, like it, like orders of magnitude, sure. much less time to, to um, put an address in and instantly populate where all the fiber yeah. um, 
is and whose fiber it is and um, what buildings are lit. Sure, and, totally different. And day, what or not. With that stuff. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's, when you think about, let, let's talk site selection on the land side of things today. Um, and I want to just kind of, you know, from your standpoint, who are the groups and just uh, biz, biz, business groups, not necessarily individual names, of companies that are, you know, really moving things forward in the um, the, the land development and the, the site selection side of things. Uh, and then, too, what's driving that? Like, just business requirements and that kind of stuff, just at a high level. Um, and then I want to get into some of the specifics around power. I want to get yeah. into some of the specifics around site size, setback, some of the things that have changed specifically with that. But just from a high level what are the company types that are driving this demand and, and, and then why is it happening? Yeah, so you, you brought up earlier a good point that, that the, the enterprise data center buyer yeah. to go buy land and build, yeah. we don't see as much of that anymore. And I think historically, as you look at what those companies have done, more often than not, um, a piece of land is found, a building is built, 10 megawatts, just to use a number, has been built out. Sure. Three megawatts is being used, and they're trying to figure out what do I do with the rest? How do I monetize the rest of this? Right. Because they've overbuilt or they've. They've, they've yeah. overbuilt. And yeah. what they said was, and, and rightfully so, IT departments were really smart in doing this, but the world changed. Yeah. And IT departments were saying, look, we're using three megawatts today, and we've been on a pretty consistent growth yeah. pattern. So, of course, we're going to use six in three years, and then sure. we're going to use nine or ten in, yep. in five years, and so we're building for 15 or 20 sure. years. So we're going to do that. It didn't really turn out that way because what happened, there are two things that happened, and there's a lot more, but the two that I always like to point to are, one, co-location providers became more reliable. Yeah, sure. They became a... Um, they became a solution that was not scary even to the banks, even mm -hmm. to the financial mm -hmm. services companies, because um, a lot of times, you know, they were worried that that um, they were not built as resilient mm -hmm. as what they would build. But we're finding uptime um, in those facilities, those yeah. co-location facilities, because they have so much riding on the line, yep. is higher than what we're seeing in. Uh, especially the older, the, the legacy enterprise mm -hmm. uh, data centers, and so you've got um, so you've 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 got fewer companies going out and building yep. that type of thing. Where where we're really seeing the growth is in the colo providers. Yep. Um, so those groups, as they're like expanding their footprint and maybe markets they're already in, or to get more you know sites across the country even from a global perspective right that's yeah. some of that growth totally multi-tenant yeah to yeah market. and global that you nailed it um globally is you know a lot of companies whose names you know here are yeah. starting to go uh you yeah know, across the world yeah and, and you got to yeah really uh interesting markets singapore is one of the hottest markets in the world yeah. right now um and um and so we're seeing a lot of that growth um we're seeing a lot of the hyperscalers yeah. growth, sure, and those companies um, are taking down. I mean, David, they're taking down two hundred uh, megawatt type yeah. sites. Yeah, go find me a, a hundred acres or two hundred yeah. acres or three hundred acres. So that's a huge growth piece of so this. So compare that to ten years ago. What were what were people asking for ten years ago? You know, you just said a hundred acres and two hundred megawatts, which I think now is actually probably pretty common with some of the deals it, that are getting done. But 10 years ago, what it was, was it? a fraction of that. Yeah. I mean, and I was going to say 10% and that's probably not right. Yeah. But you know, when we would go look for sites, we'd look for 20 acre sites. Sure. You remember doing yeah. that. Oh, yeah. uh, we'd look for 20 acre sites yeah. and we did it big for bigger ones yeah. uh, when the need arose, but um, 10 acre sites and, and to think, to think that you would ever need 20 megawatts. Oh yeah. It was like, you're going to use, you, you need, you need, power for 20 megawatts yeah and now it's like that doesn't yes day one it, it doesn't <laughs> even yeah that doesn't phase anybody and then the third piece that yeah. we don't have to spare maybe yeah. fourth is the crypto guys oh uh, yeah so there's sure. a there there is mm. a lot of driving when when china uh, stopped allowing crypto hmm. currency oh yeah there was a lot of of that growth moved to the united states Interesting. um we've got in really inexpensive power um 
I mean, power that's, you know, sub four sure. cents and in some places sub three cents. Yeah. And uh, so it makes a ton of sense for those guys. Um, it's a little bit of a different world because the, there's typically not a big credit behind mm-hmm. those those companies, but they're yeah. gigantic users. Yeah, I mean, to the side, extent that yeah. they want 500, a pathway to 500 megawatts. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask you about this. Um, we took 200 acres, acquiring 200 acres um, can only be done in certain places because, you know, as you're in a city or as you're in uh, a more populated area, just sites like that size don't exist. So typically yeah. they're pushed out. So, um, and on top of that, we've seen, you know, the data center universe have to compete with other asset real estate asset classes like the industrial totally. so if you think about the pandemic the two shining stars of the you know commercial real estate industry were the industrial world and the data center world for sure and you know i think that industrial probably developers make decisions maybe faster because there's you know the data center operators are investing more money there's a longer term probably investment in these sites um, so it's harder to make decisions but that land has been taken by a lot of industrial uses. So talk about just for those that don't know, you know, you're in the market every day, you're seeing these sites. How hard is it now to get land in these markets? Chicago, Dallas, Phoenix, Northern Virginia, Atlanta, Portland. Well, it's a great question. And we laugh about the fact that if we keep on this pace, we're going to run out of land. Yeah. I mean, literally run out of land and maybe run out of the ability to make enough power to, yeah. to power everything. Yeah. And you think about like Northern Virginia is a great example. Yeah. I mean, Northern Virginia's data center corridor is about three and the, the, the epicenter is about three and a half miles apart mm-hmm. uh, from one side from east to west. Mm-hmm. Dallas is about 33 miles. <laughs> yeah. It's a massive yeah. area. Yep. And yet it's really difficult to find yeah. good data center space in Dallas yep. that is um, – you know, anything bigger than 50, uh, 50 yeah. acres. Yeah. And I think th- these challenges are pushing the development to areas that traditionally it has not been. So in Dallas, it's pushing it to the South in, um, you know, Chicago, it's pushing it to the West in Phoenix. It's pushing it both to the East and the West. If you think of Mesa and Goodyear. So these, these, so these are real estate challenges, you know, it's obviously the power, the connectivity, uh, to the site. But that is where a site is located, and can you get the site to be big enough to accommodate? You said it, it was the, you used the word pathway, and I think that is so important today is that your customers and people that you're working with expect a pathway to a significant amount of power and to build physical buildings on sites that need to be able to hold four buildings, five buildings, et cetera. Absolutely. I think um, you know if you look at any of those markets that you mentioned, yeah. And you even look at South Dallas. The dilemma is you can you can find land, mm-hmm. but in any of those markets that are tertiary outliers yep. from a big market, you can find the land, but then you've got to get the infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. You've got to bring roads. You've yep. got to bring power. You got to bring fiber. You've yep. got to do. You got to get sewer in there. You got yep. to do water. All those things, and can it be done? Absolutely, because real estate can, sure. those things can happen. Solve those problems. You can solve those problems. It's a timing issue. Yeah. And with the supply chain issues that we're seeing yeah. now yeah. And, and with the cost of, of construction and just the manufacturing of steel products and all of that, cost is going up. Yeah. Time is going up. And, you know, if you look at just a, 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 a build uh, for, for power, yeah. how do we bring 100 megawatts to this power? to this piece of land. Well, we've got to build a substation, Mm -hmm. right? We build a substation uh, and, and what used to take, let's just call it a year. That's taken two years now. Yeah. And it's maybe 150% of what it used to cost. Yeah. And maybe even more because of the supply chain issues. And I do think we'll get out of that. I think we'll figure out a way out of the supply chain problems, but the world has changed. Yeah. The way things are delivered has changed. I mean, I can look out your window right now and yeah. see Prime driving by, sure. you know, d- delivering yeah. stuff. And yeah. it's just, it is a, it is a really um, interesting shift that we're all having to deal with. And I don't think double the critical path and time and a half or double the, p- mm-hmm. the, the cost is, is going to last. Yeah. It's not going to be there forever, but we're definitely going to have a shift that, that 
ratchet stuff. Yeah, up. we're yeah we're in that world now. Um, so you deal with land cost. You know that's obviously something that your team analyzes. You understand the dynamics behind that. Um, you know, ten years ago, if you know tracking this market in the U.S. Most big companies, if they were going to big own, uh, or build, own, and operate their own data center, would be in rural markets where land was relatively inexpensive. Yeah, probably five to seven years ago, a lot of that demand came back towards uh, bigger cities or you know areas that had more population, and typically the land in those areas is going to be more expensive. Um, so then, throw the perfect storm of all the things you just mentioned, and land prices have increased dramatically. Just talk about that. Um, and how that's even shifting some of the, the change and where people might want to go. Yeah, so I, I do think the, um, the, the tier two markets and tertiary markets, generally speaking, mm-hmm. are going to, and there's other reasons for that. Yep. There's, there's just the expansion of multiple reasons mm-hmm. why tertiary markets are going to need to um, come into play in the future. But tertiary areas within those major markets, like yep. we were talking about, um, uh, we're going to have to utilize those. Yeah, you, you can't. I mean, you look at Dallas. There's no infill sites yeah. in Dallas. You go out west, and you've got um, way too many oil and gas lines and rigs that mm-hmm. you've got to contend with. You go east, and you just don't have the fiber story that you need. So you got to go somewhere, and you go south. And um, and I think that from uh, you know, w- w- I think we will continue to see that. I mean, that you you mentioned price, and there are certain places in the country that we had a complete stranglehold on new everything about those the pricing of those land sites that 10 years ago were 25 percent of what they are today i mean literally they've quadrupled um and most of those have quadrupled since the pandemic as hard as that is to believe because we are competing so much with the logistics guys the industrial guys the logistics guys we all need the same type of space we all need a lot of it we most of us need a lot of power fiber is not so important to them as it is to us but it's a um, um, it's a it's a really tricky time and you get interesting markets like salt lake city that is built in a valley and Mm -hmm. there's only so much land there yeah and and it becomes um you know a a just a really interesting market if you're a if you're a holder of land if sure. you own land yeah and if you're trying to find land as we have tried to do for clients it's tough yeah it's, the it's we, really you know tough. we used to say that the land cost was a rounding error of the total cost right. that goes in which you know if you generally speaking those that are listening in this space you know they'd go well every, you mentioned it earlier it's all the all the equipment that goes on to the uh, end of the data center and the the hardware and all that stuff, that's where the main cost is. But, you know, uh, so the land cost is a smaller piece of that. But over the last several years, that piece has gotten a lot bigger than it was. And, and that has come, you know, if you think about the financial modeling of some of these deals and the yields that a lot of these data center operators and people like that are looking to get, that does impact you know, those numbers. It is really hard for a real estate guy to say the cost of real estate doesn't matter. Sure. I mean, because it just yeah. literally, you, you, it's ingrained in you if yeah. you've been doing it for any amount of time. The real estate cost, it does matter. Sure. But to your point, if you look at the total cost model, yep. the cost of land has gone up. Yeah. But the cost of build has gone up too. Sure. So if you yeah. look at the pie and what little slice of the pie that land piece is, yep. it's probably still in that same neighborhood. Yep. And um, but but if you if you just look at it and you're very myopic about sure. looking at just the land price and you say well that was four dollars last September and now yep. it's fourteen it's it, it impacts your your, yeah. your thinking yep and uh, and and those companies that have been in these markets for a long time looking for something couldn't yeah. pull the trigger or something else changed they look at, wait a minute you're telling me that that land that we were looking at <laughs> sure. two years ago. Yeah. is now at $14 or whatever the number yeah. is. And it's just a, it's a really interesting time. It's a hard pill to swallow for it a is. number of those. And, a, and, a and, of and, those and it is for me. Sure. It is yeah. for me looking yeah. at that and going, this can't be right. Well, yeah. I and know it, this land. Yeah. And I think, I think it's pushed the, I think it's pushed the data center operator community to have to move faster. And, you know, it only takes a few of those misses. I mean, I think there have been literal probably deals that you can look back on that companies have just missed because they didn't buy the land. They didn't do the, the, the power procurement and the For work sure. that you have to get done to be in a position to when that deal comes to have, 
the pathway to, to solve that problem. Land banking. Yeah. I mean, you're getting a lot of companies that are going out and saying, we've got to We've got to get to South Dallas. Yeah. Don't know what's going to happen there quite yet. Yep. But we got to get to South Dallas and we got to compete with these logistics guys and all the other competitors that are trying to get down. Yeah. There. It's now the, you know, we, we talk about the powered shell development. It's, I think it's now the powered site yeah. development. You know, yeah. And if you can say, hey, I've yeah, got a good five point. powered sites across the U.S. or in, you know, in Europe or APEC, those are different markets, different stories, but that's a really compelling message to have today in the market. So I want to talk about risk for a second. Yeah. So, uh, to your point, when companies are spending $500 million, a billion dollars over a 20-year period, where they spend that money is very important. There's a risk assessment that gets done on all these sites that, that your team and others will go about and do. Uh, so that is a very important part of the process. But, uh, but that's also very, like, objective. Yeah. There's also some subjectivity that comes into this, which is because if you look at Northern Virginia, you mentioned that that three-and-a-half-mile uh, section in Northern Virginia – you know, planes fly over it quite frequently just because there's an airport right at the base of it. So talk about just the that tension, you know, of, hey, we need to do all this risk assessment to make sure this site makes sense. But we need a data center site to be ready in 18 months. And these are the only two spots that can happen. Yeah, it's a, the, you're spot on again. That that is um, that is the rub. That's the that's the play that you got to go back and forth on. And. Um, your your insight to um, airports is really interesting because if you look at Chicago, yeah. if you look at Northern Virginia, um, even here in Dallas, certainly in, in Silicon Valley, they're all built, data centers are built right next to sure. uh, airports. Yep. And right at the end, in some cases, <laughs> yeah, of, the of runway. active runways, sure. as we used to say. Yeah. And um, and the reality is, is that there's not been, you know, knock on wood, obviously, um, any any airplane crashing into a, sure. a, a, a data center, um, thankfully. Um, but but things change. We were working with a client um, uh, financial institution. Yep. And um, they looked at a bunch of different sites. Um, we looked at some hazard risks in some places, but where we ended up, not to get specific, but where we ended up, um, it scored a 10 out of 10 for fiber. Hmm. And so they were able to say, there's some of these other things that we're willing to forego mm -hmm. because the fiber is so rich here. And that's really what we need yeah. to solve for. Yes. And so it's a give and take. Yep. It, it's a give and take. And, you know, if you think just about the risk profile and you and I have mm -hmm. had this conversation hundreds of times, <laughs> TIA 942, oh, yeah. the old oh, yeah. 1996 telecom standards. Yeah, yeah. Can't be too close to this yeah, road. Yeah. Can't be, you know, this far from a dam. Can't be on, on sure. close to a railroad. Yeah. Every one of those, and we'll, and and when we, and all of us who do this, you'll write a risk profile, and you'll yeah, say, hey, "Here sure. are the things that we think you should con be concerned about." And the answer, most of the time, is we agree, we agree, we agree, we agree, all the way down until we don't agree. Sure. And when we, and then when we don't agree, it's because there's something else that's trumping yep. that little piece. Yep. And we've run it through our risk assessment internally, yep. and we feel like that's not a big enough issue for us to sure. uh, kill the deal. Yeah. Over. No, I have a f funny story alert. Uh, we, <laughs> I had a, at some point, I don't know when, but had somebody ask me, you know, look at Dallas and basically, hey, we want to be at a spot where, you know, it's outside of five miles from any like large or medium sized airport. And so, okay, so we we basically draw these five mile radius circles around Dallas and we're like, there's nothing left. There's, you, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're not going to Dallas because yeah. that's the case. So like, okay. Well, maybe five miles a little, um, a we little see much. that. We see yeah. that a lot. We see that a lot. And you see restri very restrictive covenants that get broken yeah. because there are other things. And it, like I said, you know, at the very beginning, the, the cost to build a data center is really big. Yeah. And it's a, you know, it's a career changer for yeah. for somebody if it's gone if it goes the wrong way, and so you just you're you're you you're really careful about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. You, you build bet. the spread. You build the spreadsheet that says here's how we're going to get there, and uh, and you follow it as closely as you can, and yep. then you weigh those risks that you can't get around. Yep. And uh, and you make a decision. Yeah, and that's where you know. I obviously have come out of the, the brokerage world, you know, seven or eight years ago, but thinking of, 
you know, what you all are doing in the process. I mean, the process is so important. And, uh, and that's the, the, you know, so much part of the value that you all bring is that process and the ability to go back when the questions get asked to show someone, hey, this is the process that we went through. This is the analysis that we did. This is where we ended up. We were all in agreement building that internal consensus so that these people, Auditable. yeah, that have these, um, th these career uh, decisions they're making because they're, you know, the company's going, hey, we're going to spend a billion dollars and we need you three at the company to figure it out. Right. It's a lot of pressure. So it, and, everything and, you and, said and, makes and a lot and of in sense. And in that case, and you know this because you heard it said to us multiple times, is that consensus, that group of three will come to us and we say, we don't know where we yeah. where we want to be, yep. but you need to basically write a roadmap, sure. show us where we need to be, and then tell us each of the steps along the way that tell us why we need to be. Yeah, there. yeah. And again, we may, we may trump it for, for, for whatever reason, but um, sure. having a good auditable roadmap is important. When you, so let's crystal ball here for a second. Uh, over the next several years, uh, there's a number of uh, impacts that are happening right now in our space, larger demand, supply chain issues, um, globalization of our business. Where do you think this s site selection world will be in the next five years? I mean, what do you think it looks like to do this five years from now? Yeah, I, first of all, I think five years is the blink of an eye. Yep. Um, but again, you go back to what I said earlier, 13 years, uh, you know, competitive nature in Dallas. So things are moving at light speed. Um, I think there's a few things um, that we're trends that we're seeing. Number one, um, you know, from a power perspective, having multiple opportunities for renewable sure. uh, power. Um, that uh, for a long time that was a nice to have, but I'm not going to pay for it, and um, and so it's not a need to have. We're starting to see that change because the price of water and, and sun and, mm -hmm. and uh, wind are, are, are coming down. So we're starting to see that, that mix change mm -hmm. a little bit. As we squeeze the size of spaces that we can buy, um, we're starting to see, uh, you saw the big, the Infomart built four stories sure. over uh, off of Stimmons and we're starting to see multi-story multi oh, yes. um, yep. data centers. Great point. Uh, grow out of greenfield mm -hmm. um, just because of the constraint of space. Mm -hmm. And I also think that what we're going to start to see, and we've heard this on many calls in the, just the last six months, is we're going to start to see those tertiary markets mm -hmm. really start to take on um, some of the burden of the growth. Yeah. yeah no, and I think it's, it's a lot of reasons. Um, tertiary markets need the service yeah. uh, just like anybody else does. Um, mm. These things tend to cluster. Yep. Uh, as you can see, if you look at a map, it's, yeah. it's very obvious uh, that they cluster. They don't cluster in tertiary or tier two or tier three markets. You might have a little outlier. Yep. I think that that's going to start happening as, you know, uh, autonomous cars, just yeah. to use one example, need a lot of compute and they need it in a lot of different places. Yeah. And I think we'll start to see that um, as, as that technology and others continue to grow and become more mainstream, um, data centers are going to start popping up in places you never thought you'd yeah. see. Yeah, no, that's a great, great point. Um, okay, so I want to switch from business data center world real quick and ask you three things. One, okay. I, I want to make sure people know this. Brant is a very talented music musician. <laughs> His family is very talented uh, from music perspective. So what, like, what's your instrument of choice these days? Guitar? Is that what you're doing mainly? I mean, I know you can Yeah, and thanks things. for the plug. I, I don't have any records that you can go buy, uh, <laughs> but uh, I do love to play. We, we, I come from a, a, a very musical family. My, my dad uh, is a musician. Uh -huh. My mother-in-law was a musician, um, and I've got kids. Five Islands uh, is the name of their band. Okay. Uh, check it out. There we go. You have your okay. listeners. There's the plug. Yeah, yeah there's the you. plug. I play guitar. Okay. Um, and virtually everybody in my family plays something, so we get together a lot and, and just have big, fun jam yeah, sessions. Yes, one of the things I love about Brant is he will include, you know, you'll include a, a lot of people in that, and I think so Try many to. people – in our industry that you've included in that, but also too, just in Dallas have, have enjoyed that. Okay. That's one thing, the music side. So five islands, check it out. Number two, you are an incredible cook as well. So <laughs> Brand spends, he's like one of the most interesting man in the world type thing. He's but, not. <laughs> uh, so tell me, what is your like go-to if you're, you have somebody over to the house and you're making something, you kind of open the, 
the the kitchen doors what would you what would you prepare wow i'm I, i'm really good at a at uh smoking a pork shoulder okay really good at that okay but i think my best and my favorite thing to cook is um is uh chicken and fried chicken and biscuits okay and i'm cool. really good at that okay there we go and so uh, a little piece of of uh chicken breast yeah deep fried come on <laughs> and a buttermilk biscuit yeah and uh maybe a little honey or jam on top of that okay and um it seems it's it's one of my secret ways that I can get all my kids to come over to the house. Yeah. So just say, Hey, yeah, I'm making, man. I'm Absolutely. making chicken and biscuits. Yeah. And, and uh, so uh, we do that. I've got a few other things that I love to do. And my kids and wife make fun of me because I, I, I do have some serious go-tos. That, okay. We're doing that again, dad. <laughs> hey man, uh, I would never, I would never complain about that. Okay. The last thing is this. So when we were at CB, I wanted you to start a blog. Uh, you have written before in blog format for some different publications in Dallas. So this is just another encouragement. When you're ready to start the blog, I'm ready to promote it. And if you're watching this, you can encourage him too because Brent is a great writer. Um, well, I appreciate it. That too, I, so. I appreciate it. Um, you'll need to give me some content to work on, and then we can go from there. <laughs> Very good. Well, Brent, thanks so much for thanks, doing David. this. Great, to, great see to see you, and you. look forward to catching up again here soon. Sounds great. Thanks. Thanks.